When many people see scholograms the first time, they assume they're holograms. Of course, the reason they do that is that for a lot of years now, holography has been the medium that's supposed to bring you a holistic image with a great amount of depth and uh, being able to have a very good approximation of reality, although static. Uh, scholograms, in many respects, are technically superior to holograms, uh, mostly in terms of their contrast, uh, their color, and the ease of uh, display. In a schologram, you just put a diffuse light source behind the schologram, standard light source, and it works fine. The one trade-off that is weaker than holograms is essentially angle of view. The images in a schologram re repeat uh, at roughly 7 or 14 degrees um, instead of having a full, let's say, 90 degrees of, of vision. Um, but except for that trade-off, scholograms have been able to achieve the goals that have been a virtual grail of holography for the last 20 years. A schologram is photography, holography, sculpture, and computer graphics. It looks like a hologram, but it's not really a hologram. It's a barrier strip autostereogram. In the early days, we used a large garage art camera, and we'd actually uh, shoot 13 or 9 different scenes from 9 different angles. Now everything is done digitally, and it's called a stealth negative schologram. Stefan Myers has very sophisticated software, and he builds everything inside the computer. When we first begin to collaborate with the scientists, we might work from slides or videotape that they've produced for their own communication, and from that decide what sort of data might be the best for making a schologram. From that, we often have an interactive work session with the scientists, moving the data around to try and choose the way of looking at it, the view, that best suits translation into our schologram medium. One of the things that we use to help us to visualize that is the use of a stereo pair. Now, this is a stereo pair, and it's very simply a left and a right picture, and you can cross your eyes and look at it and have some idea of what this image will look like in 3D. Once the view has been decided upon, the scientists will often go back to their own computers in their own laboratory and render the finished images and then send them to us either on a computer tape or more often recently over the computer network which is direct and very very fast we can send an entire image coast to coast in just a few minutes once that's done we judge that the depth and other variables are correct and sometimes make changes in terms of deciding where the middle of the image is, the center of depth is front to back. We can view the full set of 13 frames as an animation or push it and pull it into or out of the center of depth. Once the 13 images are prepared, we can then proceed with interleaving, which is the heart of the schologram process. If you imagine that my two hands are images, we do something like that with them turning the 13 different image into one image with the different vertical lines of the image arranged together so that they, be, they form one slightly blurry looking image. This is output on computer tape and brought to IPP LithoColor where it's output on a device that's a lot like a home laser printer. From there, the output, which is black and white film, is brought to art to the nth for completion. This is a color separation. There will be three of those, one representing red light, one for green light, and one for blue light. We can preview them before actually finishing the schologram by simply laying it down on the light table and putting a line screen on top. The line screen separates out the images to provide a three-dimensional image by beaming one of the 13 images to each of your eyes, a different image to each eye, producing a three-dimensional effect. After the separations have been finished and approved, Craig registers them, taking the red, green, and blue separations and lining them up with one another to match at an accuracy of about a thousandth of an inch. He does this with a pin registration system using a piece of plastic with holes punched in it, sort of like a loose leaf paper on a set of pins, sort of like a three ring binder. And then he looks at it very closely with a loop to make sure that all three planes line up with one another properly. 
if it's off by an eight hundredth of an inch, unacceptable color fringing results and the image just doesn't look right. After the films are registered, they're brought into the darkroom for printing onto color Cibachrome film. Normally this would be done in total darkness and Craig has to work entirely blind. Each film is laid down on top of an unexposed piece of film one at a time. First the red, then the green, then the blue. This is then exposed with the corresponding color of light from a light projector overhead. After each of the three separations has been printed onto the film, the film can be taken for processing. This is lamination, the final step of the scalagram process. The image and the line screen are both glued onto opposite sides of a piece of plexiglass a quarter of an inch thick. It's then put through a set of laminating rollers, which force the glue to bond the plexiglass and the film. After it comes out the other end of these rollers, the piece is complete and can now be viewed. I have the privilege of working with the rock stars of the future, the scientists, the people from NASA Ames, the people who are doing the AIDS virus and computational fluid dynamics. It's a privilege for artists to work with scientists, mathematicians, and computer scientists. Collaborating with the people at Art to the Nth is something that's kind of grown over the past several years. Um, I think the first scalagram I did was just a little over a year ago. And in, in that year, I've probably done six or seven. And that's uh, a tribute to uh, the ease of collaboration and the excitement of collaboration between myself and the, and the people at Art to the Nth. I'm fascinated with, uh, with this technique. I think it's a wonderful way of, of visualizing scientific material, not just the structures as we see here, but, for example, ideas about the structures. And that takes a little creativity, I think. For the first time, I am seeing the depth in this particular portion of the network. And for the first time, I'm really seeing how these little processes from the neurofibers reach out to different parts of the network. So it, it was a very important and, and really enlightening moment for me because that is when I began to think that, we, that looking at things in three dimensions and working in virtual environments would be a very important advancement in neuroscience. What is... It's a marriage that works. We're on the bleeding edge, gentlemen. It's like inventing paint. Oh, we invent everything here. We're one big invention. So different are these images from any previous 3D pictures that they even have a new name, scholograms.
Tonight, measuring your wrinkles. Now there's no escaping the awful truth. Policing the trade in wildlife. The bare facts on poaching revealed by a new breed of detectives. And going 3D in screen sculpture to make these. They're so new they even invented a word for them. Scholograms, the art forms will admire beyond 2000. Hello and welcome to this edition of Beyond 2000. We're now just a year away from the Barcelona Olympics and it's from there that Amanda will report on the progress of the Olympic village that is one man's grand vision. And off the coast of Barcelona, well hundreds of men and women will be trying to fulfil their own grand visions in craft like this. They will have spent thousands of hours honing their skills on the water and I've caught up with one group who are spending a good deal of valuable time sailing off the water. Both those reports later. But first, Simon in the delivery room to witness the birth of a new and exciting art. On this show, we've exploded it, scorched it with bolts of electricity, reproduced it, and stood in awe of it. We've discovered that the marriage of science and art is a healthy one. Now in Chicago, scientists and artists are combining again to produce these, stepping into a world that's three-dimensional. So different are these images from any previous 3D pictures that they even have a new name, scholograms. They represent a combination of established technologies brought together in an art form that is already influencing scientists, mathematicians and even doctors. We're going to have 3D TV, we're going to have 3D films, and this is like 3D hard copy. It's a 3D photograph. It's an enlarged slide. You could never accuse founding artist Ellen Sandor of not being passionate. Her images directly reflect her vibrancy. We invented the term schologram because we were inspired by Man Ray, and we were inspired by Maholi Naj and his photograms. And we just invented the term, photography, holography, sculpture, and computer graphics. Here in the very same lab where the computer graphics for George Lucas's Star Wars were generated, mathematics whiz and fellow artist, Stefan Myers, begins a schologram. He sculpts an image with his sophisticated computer graphics program. The image we create isn't flat like a painting. It's an imaginary sculpture, or what I call a virtual sculpture. It's a sculpture that we can imagine and we can design, but you could probably never actually build it. This sculpture is an image of the AIDS virus. Once completed, Stefan records 13 different perspectives of the image onto a computer disk. It's like taking 13 photographs from different angles. We take the 13 pictures and we do what's called interleaving them. We combine the, the vertical stripes, the up and down stripes that like this lines on a TV, combine them together to turn the 13 pictures into one picture, all mushed up together. It's then printed and the large negative used to produce colour slides of the image originally sculpted in the computer. In its final form it's almost as if you could reach out and touch it, but pull it apart and the image no longer leaps out at you. Both the film and the barrier screen are laid out on a piece of plexiglass and then placed into a light box. The 3D is achieved by deceiving the eyes with a kind of Venetian blind effect. The tiny slits in the barrier screen only allow you to see one of the 13 images at a time from any angle. Because your eyes are at different places on your head, they are at different angles to the schologram. Therefore, you see a different image with each eye, and the brain interprets this as 3D information. Unlike holograms, the schologram is in full colour and it can be either a real or imaginary image. 
the artist has the ability to bring anything they like into the three-dimensional world. The people who always came to us in the early stages are the scientists, are the physicians, are the mathematicians, because they really are the rock stars of the future. They're ahead of their time, they're wonderful, and let's popularize them. And she's doing just that by helping them visualize abstract mathematical formula. Looks a lot better than this, doesn't it? And doctors can also visualize viruses like AIDS or herpes. Ellen suggests that one day they may even view x-rays and CAT scans in 3D. Just what other uses this technology will have in the arts and sciences will be decided in the next few years. But Ellen is already talking about the idea of ScholarVision, her own version of 3D TV. And if it means not having to wear these glasses anymore, well, I'm all for it. The glasses and 3D movies were a fad that passed. But you can be assured the passion driving Ellen Sandor won't fade. She's determined her scholograms will lead to us all seeing a lot more in 3D. It's art. It's science. It's a marriage that works. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Well... Schologram, the photography of virtual reality. Let's do la launch. to look like ornaments on a Christmas tree, a very strange abstraction that's very inviting. The image and that we kind create of for the scholar The face of sexuality in the 90s. By the same token, the extended remix reflects technology entering the pop culture scene. What we're really about, though, is sex, 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 and science. We try to do things that are on the edge, that question people, that challenge people, that really make them think. Not only, wow, what is this? How do they do this? What is this? We've transcended by giving scientists, mathematicians, even other artists a new medium in which to express the themselves. In 
images of scalagrams with computer graphics. Take the technology and view the with computer graphics. We visualize the invisible. We can actually show people what an AIDS virus might look like, or herpes, or chromium chloride, or human renin, and they're very exciting, interesting. A lot of people look at the virus and say, wow, how can I photograph what it looks like? Leonardo, eat your heart out. It all began in the early 80s. It began computer-generated scalagram where we shot off the computer screen. We weren't building the images inside the computer yet. We were still shooting them off the screen. We had to turn the video down on an inside way with Donna Cox, Tessa Wanda's not George Francis and Larry Smart. Showing it to Jenna Allman. Let us use their computer apps. She almost Let us use their mathematical scientific visualization. Maxine Brown, right? Those are the images that we got to shoot. NASA aims to research. Starting in the way. X16 privilege of R to the M to work with some of the greatest scientists in math instruction of the 20th century. Chan, John Hart, Bill Canale, commercial images. Dan Sickinger and IPP. Scalagram. Negative scalagram. Thank you, man. What do you get when art meets science? Well, in this case, you get art to the nth power, a really cool new 3D art form being developed at the Illinois Institute of Technology's Wisnick Hall. Excuse me, sir, is this Wisnick Hall? Is this Wisnick Hall? Okay, thank you. Cool. Hi, tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Ellen Sandor. I'm director of Art to the Nth Lab at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Okay, so, hey, what are we going to see here? We're going to see scalagrams, three-dimensional images, some of them computer-generated and some of them photographic. A world of wonders. A world of wonders, visual wonders. What is a scalagram? Well, it looks like a hologram, but it's full color. Mm -hmm. And it's not done with lasers. It's actually computer generated. Mm -hmm. And it looks like an enlarged slide. Mm -hmm. So is this like a, is okay. that a cross? Uh, that's a cross. It's a tribute to someone who died of AIDS by the name of Messiah. What you're seeing in the background is his CAT scan. Oh. And the CAT scan was computer processed. In the center is the AIDS virus. The dice just symbolizes chance. Like it could happen to anybody? Well, you know, it's very hard, you know, to say what. It's just about chance, hope, and death. I'm Stefan Myers, uh, Vice President of Research Development around here, an artist at large. You uh, coined the term metaphotography? Yeah, metaphotography. Um, a, a lot of people have a problem with this kind of stuff. Science as art, saying, oh, well, you know, that's not art, it's just... Uh, some of these mathematical models and such. It's the idea of looking at, at the world, the real world, in a new way, on a more abstract level. Being able to use new eyes, mm -hmm. or meta eyes, meta meaning more than, more than photography, mm -hmm. as an extension of photography. That is computational fluid dynamics. Sulfur ion cluster. So you guys use a lot of big words here, right? Mm, the more syllables, the, uh, the more time you have to think. <laughs> What we're showing you here is actual mathematical chaos. And there's a correlation in your real-time lives. This is the first example of a cylindrical barrier strip autostereogram, mm. where instead of making a flat piece, we've curved the plexiglass that it's on, and the math entirely changes when that happens. We're on the bleeding edge, gentlemen. It's like inventing paint, you know? You're constantly both developing and pushing forward the medium while inventing an aesthetic to work with it. Oh, we invent everything here. We're one big invention. Art is an addiction. Anyone who becomes addicted, I feel really sorry for you. What if a nutty viewer wanted to buy one of these things? Is that possible? Yes, Feature Gallery, New York City, Hudson. And they might spend? They might spend money, money. Not a lot. Remember, art is all relative. So people can see this by appointment? Absolutely. They can call me, Ellen Sandor, at the Illinois Institute of Technology, Art to the Nth Lab, 312-567-3762. Yeah. Yeah. Chaos. Chaos.